Hey, hey, you guys, welcome back to my channel. How are you today? Today we're gonna do something a little different. So, um, I was kind of itching to do a Q&A the same day that I was going to post on Instagram, hey, send me your questions. Um, I saw that Leanne posted um, her video on assumptions you have about me. With an assumptions you have about me video, I feel like it takes it to another level. You as a subscriber um, get more of the freedom to pass your judgment, which we all do, you know, everyone judges. So you're able to, you you have the liberty to express your judgment and then see if you have been perceptive or not about me. And then I get to see through your lens, through your eyes, or how I've been carrying myself, how I've been promoting myself, um, and kind of the vibe that I give off. Now, I didn't realize that this video was gonna potentially hurt my feelings, so <laughs> maybe it did a little bit, but uh, we're gonna talk about it. The number one most common assumption made was you're rich, you're wealthy, you're rolling in the dough or whatever. There were so many, um, there were so many that were around money and and finances and stuff like that and it's funny because i don't feel like i give off like i i don't feel like i give off the typical youtuber vibe that you that you see and i'm not being salty and i'm not throwing shade i mean if you have hustled and you're 20 and you're rolling in dough and you want to go get louis vuitton sneakers and pay a really ridiculous price for them that's awesome if you want to go get you know two hundred thousand dollar cart that's awesome do your makeup in your fancy car that's fine you know i get it but i'm always like i don't think i give off that vibe um maybe i do i do like nice things I will say that and I will never deny it. I have spent $600 on sneakers, but I also grew up very poor and I know what it's like to have nothing. And so I've grown up with this mentality that uh, money is fleeting and I can't, I can't die with my money. I can't take my money with me. Um, and money, money solves a lot of problems. Money isn't the end all be all and money does not equal happiness, but it does help. You know, and so for me, it's something that kind of slips through my fingers. Um, if I see that someone needs it, if I see that it can help, if I see that I can pay for something, um, I'm not uptight with it, I guess you can say. So maybe that's the vibe that you guys are picking up on. But am I rich to get back to that assumption? No, absolutely not. I am a single mom, I have one income. I have to raise my two kids and my four sick dogs. You guys, I pay about $500, maybe more, just on my dogs every month. So from their insurance, to their medicine, to their office visits with their vet. Um, and so it, it can be pretty expensive just on one income, but you know what? We hustle, we make it, we make it work, okay? So no, I'm not rich, I wish I was. No. <laughs> Your guilty pleasure is listening to Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj is actually um, on my gym playlist a lot. A lot of Nicki Minaj is on my gym playlist. Um, and I may know all the words to a few of her songs. Um, I don't know if I'm bragging or mildly embarrassed. Like, I, I can't decide yet. A little bit of both. I assume you would like to get married again in the future. Um, I didn't think about getting married again until I met Parker, which is weird. Um, I was perfectly fine not getting married um, and just being in a happy, stable relationship because um, in my first marriage, I learned that a certificate, like a legal document, doesn't stop someone from doing things they shouldn't and it doesn't stop you from hurting. It's not gonna control you um, to make good choices or bad choices. You know, it's a piece of paper. It doesn't mean anything. So I was like, why am I gonna go through this trouble again um, and the whole last name thing and combined assets and all of that mess? Like why, why go through so much work, you know, when my word should be enough to someone? Like, hey, guess what? 
I vow to be faithful to you and love you for the rest of your life, but I don't need a legal document. Are you cool with that? Okay, we're cool. Um, and then I met Parker and he has two teenage daughters. Um, and for the first time in the years that I've been divorced, I thought as a woman, I can't in good faith and good moral conscience cohabitate with their father. Um, and set a good example at the same time, you know? And to each their own. You may not believe in marriage and that's totally fine, but for me, I, I wanna stack the deck as much as I can. And if I'm gonna be a part of these young ladies' lives, then I want to inspire them to be the best they can and, and to wanna chase that fairy tale and, and that to believe that it exists. You know, they, they have divorced parents just like my kids have divorced parents. And just because your parents are divorced doesn't mean that you can't have the fairy tale marriage, you know? You have an easy time meeting people and making friends. Um, I have an easy time meeting people. I have an easy time talking to strangers. I have an easy time being loquacious and social. Um, I don't have an easy time making friends. I am very guarded. Um, my circle is this big. Um, but once you get in the circle, you know my blood type, you know? <laughs> I will murder for you. <laughs> Another very common assumption was you're very positive. You can't be positive all the time. Why are you so positive? You're the positive friend. You're the friend that people go to when they need positivity. Um, but the most common assumption was laced almost with like a cynical innuendo like this one that says nobody can be that happy all the time. How does she do it? Um, I saw a post about a month ago that said, because you deal with trauma, with humor, it doesn't invalidate your trauma. So I don't know if you guys um, are familiar with this generalization, and I know it's a stereotype, but it comes from a place of validity. Um, a lot of comedians, if not most, have a very sad story um, whether they deal with depression or some sort of abuse, um, whether it's substance, sexual, you name it, you know, some sort of trauma. And they cope with life with humor. And so I learned from a very young age that my attitude shouldn't be strictly derivative of how I'm treated. Um, my attitude shouldn't be controlled by someone else. You know, because if someone does something and it hurts my feelings, they can do whatever they want. I'm the one that chooses to get her feelings hurt or not. So I choose to be happy and I will wake up in the morning and I'll be like, you know what, today, I don't care what happens today, today I'm gonna be happy and this, this, is, this is what's happening, okay? Um, and I make that choice. I choose to be happy and bubbly that day. But there are some days and um, that I just can't, I can't do this. I can't do the woo, you know, I just can't do it. I can't do it because, you know, stress and life and drama and family and, you know, just there's so much going on. So no, I'm, I'm not this happy all the time. I'm not this bubbly all the time. The majority of the time I am but not always. <laughs> and when it hits me, it hits me hard and I get sad and I get mad and I have to do all the things like eat the carbs and do a workout and maybe go scream in the closet and eat two pounds of chocolate to get over it. You know, <laughs> my sister loves you so much. Can you please give her a shout out? Her name is Daisy Rasso. <laughs> Hi Daisy. <laughs> shout out to Daisy. Um, you are a great mom. Oh God, I wish that were true. I struggle with it every night. Um, I go to bed and I'm like, I could have been better today. I could have loved them harder today. I could have been more patient today. I could have done more, you know? And every night my I go to bed, I lay my head down and I'm like, I failed again and I failed again and I failed again. So I think that's a sign of wanting to be a good mom, you know? So I don't I don't think so. I I don't think I'm a great mom, but I do think I try just as hard every single day to 
to be a good mom, you know? Man, being a mom is hard, you guys. There were a lot of assumptions about my voice, whether it's a nervous voice, whether it's um, an attention-seeking voice, or just comments about my voice. Here's two that I'm looking at now. I love your voice, especially when you say, I love you. You're the sweetest. Thank you. When I go, I love you. <laughs> And that's actually monster voice. So every night when I put my, my boys down, I go, good night, I love you, see you tomorrow. And that's just, and we do that and they, they answer the same way. They go, see you tomorrow, but in their baby voice. <laughs> so that's monster voice. Um, I have always wanted to do voices, um, like in cartoons, like I've wanted to voice over characters. Um, I don't think I would be successful at it. But like I do Cookie Monster voice and I'll do Elmo voice and I'll do Monster voice and like Demon voice. And so I naturally change my voice inflection, whether it's yelling at you guys or it's baby talk. Um, I notice I'll baby talk if I'm embarrassed to ask for help. So if I want something from you, which will happen kind of like a solar eclipse, like every 10 years, um, and I, I need to ask you for something, I get like baby quiver voice, and it's just, I'm like a billboard, you know, with sound. So everything is always on my face and in my voice. You'll hear it in my tone, it, it, it changes. Another assumption was that I overthink. There were several um, assumptions of you overthink, you overthink like me. If overthinking, were the shade of purple on my skin, I would be Barney. <laughs> I also got the assumption of I am stubborn. You might be a bit stubborn. I don't think so. I've always wanted to say I'm not to the point where I'm willing to argue that I'm not stubborn. So what does that say? <laughs> if you ask my mom, she would say she would call me Terca empedernida when I was little. And I was like, Terca, I'm not Terca. Like, ugh, I'm just right. <laughs> you were a nerd in school. I was, I really was. I was a full on super nerd. Um, I was in AP classes, honors classes. For me, school was a means to a way. Like I wanted to do well in my education and I wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. I don't have fond memories of high school. I don't have fond memories, especially of college. Um, I think there are certain things that you have to go through in life to shape you into who you're meant to be. And as much as I hated high school, and I hardly ever use the word hate, for me, you know, the funny thing is, I'll let my boys use certain bad words in my home. I know I'm the worst. Um, I won't let them use the word hate. I can't. Um, I don't like those finite, very extreme words like hate, always, never, you know? I hated high school. I hated college. It was a very awful time. Um, and so I focused on my education and I thought, I never wanna be back here again. And then I go back to teaching high school. <laughs> You see the cup half full in every situation. Um, I see the cup as being a cup. Um, I'm just thankful I have one, you know? Um, I'm not a half empty kind of girl and it's hard for me the older that I get to be a half full kind of girl. At this point in life, I'm just thankful I have a cup. You know, I'm like, hey, it could be worse. You really want a baby with the boyfriend. Listen, there will be no babies had there will be no babies bought, there will be no babies made, there will be no babies held, there will be no babies baby related, unless it's a baby dog, there is no babies in, in my future ever, whether it's with Parker or The Rock or Gerard Butler, there's no babies, okay, just no babies. Although, me and Parker would make a cute baby, there's no baby, no babies. Uh, <laughs> YouTube will keep changing you. Um, this kind of hurt my feelings a little bit because I was like, I don't think I've changed. I mean, I give less now about YouTube um, in terms of the hate comments and how mean people are and how they like, like just cut you and cut you and keep cutting you. Like I give less about that now, but I don't think I've changed. I think I'm the same ridiculous, goofy, silly 
don't take myself serious at all type of person. Um, but then again, everyone changes. So maybe I have, and maybe I'll keep changing to you. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. You were a unicorn in another life. I was like, I mean, can we talk about this right here? This doesn't happen naturally, okay? In my previous life, it happened naturally. Now, I miss my horn, okay? You always let your own cup go dry because you're constantly filling others. Um, yeah. And I think I've gotten to the point in my life where as happy-go-lucky and optimistic that I am, I am a little cynical now. And I just have taken this approach this year where I'm like, nah, bro, sorry. Oh, well, you know, I just can't keep burning out. And I can't keep burning out uh, for people that my help and my love and my showing up for them has become an expectation. You know, it's not appreciated anymore because it's what they expect. When you start taking someone for granted and they realize you're not getting them back, you know, so you have to be really, really careful and just recognize those people that are in your corner showing up for you and doing things they want to do for you because they can, not because they need to and not because they're expected to. Those people, you guys, they're gems. Hold on to them tight, appreciate them, and never take them for granted. Because once they're like, bye, they're not coming back. This one cut me a little deep because it was very personal. She said, you are not as strong as you seem. I put on the brave face. <laughs> I am... I think we all have our exterior personality, our exterior character, the mask that we wear. And then we all have the heart and the soul of who we are. And if I were to take off that outside cover, the inside me would be that seven year old little girl that spoke broken English, that didn't have any friends, that would eat her bean burrito, her cold bean burrito for lunch by herself at recess um, and would go home and wonder why I didn't have any friends. So that's who I am inside, which is why I have that almost compulsion to always want to be happy, always make sure everyone's happy, always make sure that everyone looks at the bright side of things. It gets better, it gets better, it gets better because it sucks being sad, you know? It sucks feeling unloved. It sucks being not chosen. And for me, I feel like childhood trauma cuts so deep and it's something that you never forget but it's also something that happened in your life that could have taught you the most important lesson that you're ever gonna learn in life. And that's life is what you make of it. You know, of course it could be better, but it could always be worse. Count your blessings. Don't count your hardships. You know, I feel like oftentimes we turn to our friends and it's to complain and it's to gripe and it's to mope and it's to, you know, just focus on, oh, everything is bad and, and you know, we had a fight and I, I can't, you know, uh, I lost a job or this or whatever. And it's like, do we ever call our friends and say like, oh my God, my kid got great, great grades in school and I feel so blessed, I have a roof over my head. You know, I could afford a new wardrobe for my kids. You know, it's very easy to focus on the negative instead of the positive. And I don't know how that assumption turned into like a seven minute pontification about counting your blessings. Sorry guys, this is out of control. You are pregnant. <laughs> Did we just talk about babies? <laughs> you like to act happy and chipper so those around you know you aren't okay. Um, it is a coping mechanism for me. Like if I, if I fake it till I make it, it'll work, you know? Um, but those around me, I told you guys, my circle is like this big. Those around me, Parker, Sam, my parents, um, they know. They're like, all right, cut the crap, what's going on? All right, you guys, if the angle's a little off, it's because my other camera got overheated, as per usual. Your strength and kindness have made a greater impact than you know. Um, you know, there have been several occasions where uh, I talk to Sam uh, or my mom or Parker and I tell them that I don't see myself doing YouTube for, you know, a long time. Um, I don't think that I'm contributing in any way. I don't think that what I'm doing is, is, is doing anything useful except entertainment, right? Um, and they always turn around and give me some like pep talk about the difference that I make and how 
you know, people tune in for companionship and because I make them smile and because I teach them things. And so um, I usually say like, hey, I miss teaching because you have, you have the gift to um, enrich the lives of so many every day, right? With education, wisdom, whatever. Um, and they'll always turn around and say, well, what do you think you're doing? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like YouTube can be vapid, you know? Um, but hey, look, if someone watches one video and it changes their day, it changes their mood, it teaches them what vapid means, <laughs> then then I, I, I'm, I'm doing a good job. So I hope that I'm having an impact on you guys in some way. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I struggle to believe that I am. You would say yes to Parker if he asked you to marry him this year. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I rushed into a marriage once already and I'd hate to make that mistake again. But I also believe that every situation is different, you know? Um, we have our ups and downs and then I have certain times where I feel like, man, we know each other so well, let's move in tomorrow. And then there are other times where I'm like, do you even know me? <laughs> do you know anything about me? <laughs> Get out of my house. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so there's kids involved now and it's not that easy. I think if there were no kids involved, um, probably yes. But now that there's kids, um, I'm not marrying one person. I'm marrying three, you know, and it's it's a big deal. So I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I think you're the type of person who likes to control and plan everything. I am. <laughs> You try not to spoil your kids. Uh, operative word being try. I try, but I also fail. <laughs> I grew up um, wanting a lot. Um, I was happy. I was a happy kid because I saw how hard my parents worked and I saw how hard they loved us. But I grew up wanting. And the idea that my kids would know what want feels like and not be able to have it makes me sad. But then I'm also like, hey, I grew up wanting and now I know the value of things, you know? So I really try not to, but then they go to their dad's house and they get everything and I'm like, dang, now it's a competition. That's another thing I would write in that book. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, you gotta go watch this vlog. I just drilled on myself um, where I talk about it. This assumption, um, pissed me off, like flat out pissed me off. And I know it's weird to say, cause I'm usually like, yeah, the world is sunshine and bubbles and unicorns. This assumption pissed me off, but guess what? I asked for it. I think you're a pretty self-involved person. I don't see you thinking of others often. I think my demise will be that I never put myself first, that I'm always thinking of others, that I burn the candle on both ends. And even when I'm already struggling, I'm still giving. The problem is though, that I go down this path of giving and giving and giving to people that don't appreciate it, or that when they need to step up, when they need to step up and reciprocate, they forget. Um, and so it made me mad because if you watch my content even remotely a little bit, you know how far that is from the truth. Um, I wish I was a little more self-involved. And I will have to say this though, I am the number one advocate for moms. Take care of yourself, get a babysitter, get your hair done, take care of yourself. Love yourself first because if you don't take care of yourself and you're not happy, you're not gonna be a good mom. That's different though. But self-involved where I don't think of others, I was like, <laughs> Meet me outside. <laughs> Here's an assumption that validates what I just said. You take really good care of the people you love, sometimes neglecting yourself in the process. See, I told you guys, y'all know me. Well, most of you do. <laughs> you are the same on and off camera. Um, that is the number one thing people tell me when I have to do an appearance, when I have to do an engagement um, or an interview or anything that involves me meeting you guys. Um, I always hear that, that you are the same. And I am the same. I feel like that's the only way that I can keep up. <laughs> Plus it's easier, right? 
you are jealous and controlling. Um, I am jealous. I, I'm definitely jealous, but I think that's the ridiculous, fiery Latina stereotype where I'm like, why did she make eye contact with you and not with me? But you guys, everywhere we go, everywhere we go, if there is a waitress, if there is um, a cast member, a, I don't care where we are, if it's in Orlando at Disney or we're at a restaurant or we're at Sephora or it's a waitress, whatever, they're like, hi, how are you guys doing today? Can I take your order? And I'm like, hello, hi, can I have uh, something to drink? <laughs> Stuff like that, I get a little jealous. But jealous, like, where are you? How long are you gonna take? When are you gonna be here? Why aren't you here yet? You know, not like that. So I guess jealous a little bit, but it's of others, not of my significant other. It's not like he inspires the jealousy, it's more other people do. I assume you try to fake it till you make it a lot. Not negatively, just like to act happy when you aren't. Well, you hit the nail on the head with that one. <laughs> you unapologetically love with your whole heart. Um, I do. And I think that's why I hurt so much. Um, if I miss you, I tell you I miss you. If I love you, I tell you I love you. If I want to see you, I tell you I want to see you. Um, I wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, I show my emotions. I... If I, once I go hard, I'm hard, I'm in, I'm invested, I'm done, I'm, I'm, I jump into the pool, head on, head first, feet first, whatever, I just jump in. I don't pace myself into love or relationships or affection or any of that stuff. You know, I'm very outwardly affectionate, I'm very verbally affectionate. I just, I love love. <laughs> You're super funny. Um, I try to make that obvious, you guys, but if it's not, I am pretty hysterical, no, and I'm humble. <laughs> um, when I first moved to Dallas, my family would call me or FaceTime me every time they have a party, and they would be like, we miss you, the clown isn't at the party, you know? <laughs> I've never taken myself too seriously. You have one life, like it's not that serious. Relax, calm down, make you know, make fun of yourself. And I think I learned that at a very young age where if I made fun of myself and I didn't take myself too seriously and I was goofy and like the comedian and I beat people to the punch, then they couldn't make fun of me kind of thing. So it was more like a coping mechanism, but it just kind of stuck. And I was like, well, if it makes people laugh, I love to make people laugh. If I can make you laugh, it's like giving you a hug without actually touching you. I know that sounds creepy, but I love hugs, okay? I'm a hugger. <laughs> this one, you guys, was so common. How could I forget? You're not into Mexican men. You don't date your own race. You don't like Mexican men. You don't date Mexican men. Okay, so y'all have some time for some tea? So my very first real love, I would say, was Roman. Shout out to Roman and Chula Vista. Uh, and this person broke my heart into like four million pieces, right? He was like my dream man at that moment in time. And I think when you live in California, Southern California, super Southern California, right up against the border, and you frequent lounges and restaurants and bars and everything in Tijuana right at the border, all you have is Mexican men, right? Um, I was always too tall for them. And it was always like, ay, estás bien alta, mija. Lástima que no me traje mis botas. You know, and it was always this, I'm super macho, but I'm secretly insecure because you're so tall. I'm super strong and I know how to fix things with tools. Yeah, but why are you so tall? Yeah, uh, I'm awesome because I have a gun and ride a horse, but why are you so independent? How come you don't need me? Did you just open your own car door? I don't like you wearing red lipstick. And so I was like... So the story about my first love is not really relevant as much as it is, yeah, I dated. I dated Mexican men. I liked Mexican men, um, but if I were to create a gross generalization and stereotype of my dating experience with Mexican men, I wasn't very successful 
because I didn't need them. Um, and like I said, it's a gross generalization. It's a stereotype, but obviously that was what I chose. That's what I picked. So I'm speaking from my personal experience. Do I have a type? No. Do I have like a specific type of guy that I know? Um, in fact, I didn't, uh, think that I would even be attracted to like a white guy. And then I met Parker and he's as white as, as they come. Uh, and I'm crazy about him, you know, he's perfection. And so for me, what ends up happening with any of my relationships, romantic, friendship, familial, anything, any new person in my life, after a few interactions, I don't know what you look like. I know how you think. I know how you feel and most importantly I know how you make me feel and whether I want to be around you or not so I don't not like to date Mexican men I just feel like they don't like to date me <laughs> oh my gosh you guys this one was one of my favorites you have perfect teeth so I'm guessing you don't eat candy ever okay true story um candy is my end-all be-all uh candy is my oxygen uh, candy is my go-to. Uh, my mom, when I was little, could get me to do anything for candy. Daniela, vamos a la tienda. Okay, just get me candy. Uh, Daniela, limpiame la casa. Candy. Daniela, vamos a hacer los pagos. Did you guys ever do that? Go make the payments with your, with your family? Let's go make the payments, all the payments on all the cards. <laughs> she would get me to do anything with candy. In fact, I would steal my brother's Easter and Halloween candy. He would hide it, I would find it, and I would leave all the wrappers. I would hide candy under my pillows and I didn't have my very first cavity until I was 22. A lot of awful things happened between 21 and 22 that maybe one day I'll tell you about. A cavity being one of them. <laughs> so candy, I think that's one of our bonding um, things between Sam and I is our love for candy. So that was a bad assumption because candy is my life. <laughs> This one was deep, you guys. I was like, are you reading my diary? Even though you're in a relationship, you're very insecure, it might end for a random reason. Um, yeah, especially after reading my horoscope. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I think that's how most breakups happen, especially in like a seemingly perfect relationship. You know, it just suddenly ends randomly. You just decide, you're like, hey, you know what? we're probably not getting married. Do you want to just, do you want to just end this? And then you decide and then you do it and then it's over. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, toco madera, but um, you just never know. You know, you never know these days. They might have a hidden calculator app on their phone and it might be like a secret serial killer or I don't know, they might kidnap puppies for fun. You know, so it just, you never know. Oh my God, you guys, you are the let me talk to the manager lady that they make memes about. <laughs> So I am the girl that will say, I'm um, sorry, can I have the um, pasta with no onions, please? And then they bring it out with onions and I'm like, it's okay, I'll still eat it. Like, that's me. <laughs> Sam came to visit once and I bought my son this little set of little two little trucks and they had batteries in them. We walk out of the store, I turn them on, one of them doesn't work. So I told Sam, it's okay, let's just go back inside. So I get in line again and she's like, the f you're getting in line after we already waited in line and I was like you know <laughs> she's like give me that she walks to the front of the line and she's like she just bought this car it doesn't work blah 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 she wasn't rude about it but she was like very east coast about it and I was like oh, my hero I'm the one that'll never send anything back I won't complain about it I'm like it's fine I'll make it work I mean I'm definitely allergic to x y and z but it's okay I'll eat it <laughs> this one was interesting to me because um, I was like, oh no, does that mean I don't talk about him enough? Um, you're an only child. I have an older brother. He's a year and nine months older than me. He is my total antonym. He is um, introverted, extremely intelligent. I mean like Sheldon Cooper intelligent. Very, he's all intellect. Um, he is not a social butterfly. He is not loquacious. Um, he has really smart humor where he won't crack a smile, but he'll say it. He'll say like the most hilarious thing in a very dry tone and most people won't catch it. Um, he is, 
he, we don't even look the same. You know, he, we, we don't look at all the same. We went to college, the same campus, uh, for about a year or two at the same exact time. We both worked for academic computing. We talked, we hung out, and no one knew we were brother and sister. <laughs> So I'm sorry that I don't talk about my brother enough, but I'm not an only child. I have an older brother and he's awesome. He was my only friend, but he had to be because by default, he's my brother. He's obligated to. <laughs> there were a lot of questions regarding Spanish, whether I speak it, whether I don't like to speak it, whether I speak it to my kids. Um, it's my first language. I'll always speak it. I will always speak it to my kids. I don't require that they speak it back, but I do speak it to them. Um, I love speaking Spanish. I think there is just a really special, delicious way of expressing myself in Spanish that I haven't been able to master in English. So Spanish will always be my first language, my first love, my first form of communication besides hugs. You make your voice sound super chipper on purpose. It's not naturally like that. Chipper or high pitched. My normal voice is like this. This is my normal voice. Um, I don't think it's much different when I'm like, hey, hey, you guys. <laughs> I think it's just excitement level, you know? So there's a little difference. So I'm not faking it, I'm just excited. So it's like, I can't be like, hey, hey, you guys, this is my normal voice, but I'm excited. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm not faking anything. I don't think I am physically capable of ever faking anything. <laughs> ever. <laughs> this one was like, okay, well, calm down there, Susan. That's not really her name. Um, you are in Texas because of your custody arrangement. Otherwise you would move. I'm in Texas because I love Texas and I don't want to move. Um, I, I like it here. My, I like it here so much that I think that even if we hadn't had children, um, I would have stayed. I love Dallas. Love it. Love it. I feel at home. Plus, you know what? At the end of the day, my boys deserve to grow up with their dad, you know? And so, I don't know, like, I think even if it wasn't in the arrangement, it wouldn't have even been a question for me to think about, you know? It's like, no, where are we gonna live? Cause you only to see each other, you know? You're a neat freak and totally organized. That is not a secret. And that is a perfect assumption. <laughs> you would like your ex to approve of your kids being on camera. Um, I think life happens and life changes and you may have had an opinion one day and then eventually it turns into a different opinion, you know? And so for me, my kids are my everything, you know? Um, I could, I could lose my relationship tomorrow and I would be sad, but I'd get over it. I would never ever get over something happening to one of my kids. You know, it's a different kind of love. It's, it's that type of love that you feel so deep and it hurts so hard that you're constantly worried, you're constantly uh, hard on yourself, you're constantly happy, you know, it's just, it's such a stressful thing to have a child. <laughs> It's the biggest blessing, but it's such a worry. And as much as I was adamant about sharing my personal life and my kids with YouTube, as I see them grow up and I see them flourish and come into their own personalities, I am so proud of them. And I would want nothing but to share them with you guys and for you guys to see why I'm so happy and why I'm so proud because these little kids, and you're obviously going to say the same thing about your own if you're a parent, but as much as they give me multiple aneurysms a day, um, they're the best thing I've ever done in my life. And happiness like that shouldn't be contained you know it shouldn't be a secret um i'm so proud of them i love my boys they're they're perfection they're adorable i call them watermelon and coconut because their heads are so big <laughs> um i call them my little nerds um we'll be at the store and i'll be like come on nerds <laughs> and people look at me like 
And I'm like, listen, love is love, okay? Don't tell me how to love my kids. <laughs> They're just perfect. They're perfect. They, you can tell right now, like, I can't stop gushing. Like, my cheeks hurt. I'm smiling so hard because I love my perfect little, my perfect little terrorists. <laughs> They're amazing, you know? And so, yeah, I, I guess I would love to share them with you guys at some point. But I also... 100%, 200% honor and respect their dad's wishes. So we're gonna keep it that way. Are you passive aggressive or what we see is what we get? Um, if I had a superpower, like if I were a super villain, it would be being passive aggressive. But I know, I know the power of my ability, so I only use it for good. Just kidding. <laughs> But no, like I told you guys, I'm gonna be 100% honest with you. If I was a super villain, my superpower would be being passive aggressive. I don't do it because I know how obnoxious it is. But there are some times where I just like really, like I just, I could be so good, you know? Like I could just, I could just give you the biggest dig or burn, you know? But I, I can't. That just wouldn't be nice. Plus, you know what I've noticed is those moments of weakness where I succumb to pettiness, I don't feel good afterward. So I wouldn't be a very good super villain. Oh my God, this one is so funny. You're really good at math. So if there were a kryptonite to defeat me from being a super villain, it would be math. <laughs> I think you carry a lot of pain inside. Um, I think we covered that at the beginning of this video. I think everyone deals with a lot of pain and hardship, but I think that you really have to keep your eyes open for those individuals that go out of their way to make others happy, to go out of their way to convince people that they're, they're doing great, they're in a great place. I think you really have to keep your eyes peeled for those that are always trying to make people laugh, that are always trying to make people smile, that are always showing up for others. They are the ones that carry the most sadness, the most trauma, the most struggles. Um, they're just really good at hiding it. Um, and so show up for them, you know? Even when it doesn't seem like like they need your help, you don't, you don't need to help them, but just show up, let them know you're there, you know? You get shy around cute boys. Well, certainly not my two cute boys. <laughs> but yeah, when, um, if I was ever approached by a guy, like at a bar or a restaurant, I'm the girl that's obnoxiously awkward um, or say something inappropriate or laugh so loud I snort and then they look at me like, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm that girl. I'm dorky, I'm a nerd, I'm a geek. I do, I'm not graceful when it comes to my interaction with men. I'm not like, yeah, so. Um, I saw you looking at, you know, um, I, I can't. You know how there's some people that just carry sex appeal like it's their superpower, like Chloe Morello? Like, she could be sitting on the toilet and she's gonna look like a Victoria's Secret Angel supermodel and just have this aura of sexual confidence. That's never me. <laughs> I'm this girl. <laughs> this one made me giggle a little bit. You don't get along with your sister-in-law. That's assuming my brother's wife. She and I are sisters. I probably love her more than my actual brother. Um, she's awesome. She's amazing. I mean, amazing. You know when like God lost an angel because she's down here taking amazing care of my brother and their two kids? That's her, she's awesome. So I'm assuming that's sister-in-law because I don't have another one. <laughs> I assume you say the F word a lot. I need to quit using profanity. I discuss myself with how liberally I use foul language, you guys. And I'm publicly shaming myself because I really want to stop. Like I need to. I say it and it's gotten to the point where I can't control it anymore. Before I would catch it and I'd use it for effect. Now it just bloop, just comes right out. But here's the thing, and I'm not making excuses for myself. I grew up in a household where my dad didn't cuss and my mom, every other word out of her mouth was a cuss word. But she doesn't cuss in public. She doesn't cuss at work. She doesn't cuss around other people. It was only in our home. And so she has that ability to switch it on and off. 
and I used to, now, I don't know why I'm doing this, now it just comes out and it comes out in really inopportune moments and I'm so embarrassed. So I'm working on it. Shame me if you hear me say anything I'm not supposed to, but I do. And I think we're gonna cut it short with this one. Um, I thought this was a really good one to end on because I get a lot of questions about um, divorce or rather going through divorce and then deciding to date again. So this assumption is you waited a while to date after your divorce. I haven't been shy about this subject. I think you have to. I think if you wanna do it right and you want to be emotionally healthy, um, you have to. And I think you have to for a lot of reasons. You have to because you're in a place of extreme sadness, fear, anger, resentment, cynicism. Um, I don't care if it was a friendly divorce. It's still emotionally tiring and no one that is running a marathon can run one right after it. You know what I mean? So I waited a little over a year to start dating again and I did it because I walked into my closet and I looked around and I was like, who lives here? Whose clothes is that? Whose shoes are those? I didn't have a single pair of heels in my closet. I was like, who is this woman? So I promised myself in that moment, standing in my closet, that I was gonna date myself. I needed to get to know myself. I didn't know who the heck I was. I didn't know what I liked. I didn't know what I didn't like. I didn't know, you know, where I shopped, what clothes I liked, what shoes I liked. I didn't know how much I loved wearing heels because I wasn't wearing them in my marriage, you know? And so I waited a year because I wanted to date myself. And I know that sounds so cliche and like women empowerment and feminism. It's not meant to be. It's just, it's meant to be a fact, you know, you've met someone, you're over here, they're over here, you meet them and then you combine lives and then you kind of become one person. You have the same friends, you have the same family, you have the same outings, you eat the same food, you cook together, you live together, you sleep together, you do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. It's monotonous. Um, speaking of a marriage that ends in divorce, right? Not like a, a, a happy marriage. Um, and so, you have to get to know yourself again. Like, who are you? What do you like? What do you do? What? I wasn't even wearing the right size underwear, okay? <laughs> I'll never forget, we're at the mall and I'm trying to buy underwear. And this is one of those things that causes me physical pain to do. Like, I hate buying underwear. I'll do it maybe once every two years. And once I find a style I like, I get like 40 pairs. And Sam was like, well, what are you looking for? I was like, medium, I can't find medium. There's no medium. And she's like, for who? She's like, do you wear saggy panties? <gasps> you wear saggy panties. And I was like, are you making fun of me? Inside of Victoria's Secret, publicly, in front of everyone? <laughs> so, yes, I waited. I waited a year before dating because I dated myself and I wanted to get to know myself. I wanted to love myself again. I wanted to, you wanna say hi? Come here, come here. Okay, 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 Sophie girl. So I had to get to know Sophie all over again. You know, I had to get to know what's the matter? What's in your mouth? Did you get into trouble? Huh, were you getting into something you weren't supposed to? Mm-hmm. You're acting suspicious, little lady. So I guess the only really comfortable and confident piece of advice that I could give you that's divorce related, because otherwise I, I just, I won't touch it with a 20 foot pole, um, is find yourself again, date yourself again, love yourself again, respect yourself again, date yourself, see what you like, what are your passions? What are you gonna write on your match profile? If you were to describe yourself like an ad, and I know this sounds awful, if you were to describe yourself like an ad, like a car, what are your features? Not like brown eyes and brown hair, but what are your features? 
What do you know? What are you passionate about? What ignites you? What drives you crazy in a bad way and in a good way? Um, what would your friends say about you? Who are you? And so, yeah, long story short, that big loop around that question or assumption is I, I did. I took a year off. And once I was sure of who I was and what I wanted and what I didn't want again, um, I started to date and I sucked. I sucked for a year and a half. Oh man, I was awful. God, my picker was broken. <laughs> but again, I had to wait. I had to learn myself again and I had to adjust the picker because the picker was really broken for a while. Anyway, thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> Thank you for all of you guys that submitted your assumptions. Thank you for those that hurt my feelings. Thank you for those that piss me off, but especially thank you for those that are committed and invested in this community and know me so well and are so kind to me and are always so generous with your support and your time and just your kindness. I feel like kindness is a currency and not very many people are rich in it. You know, so if you are, I know who you are because you're generous and I really, 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 really appreciate it. Anyway, that was a horrible example because that's implying that some of you are poor because you're mean, but that's just, okay, maybe my example was bad, but you know what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is I love you guys so much and you know what to do. If you found this video useful, entertaining, and learned something, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time. This coffee break is over. Bye guys.